there's something so beautiful about when we get to come together and just worship together. You know, there's something so powerful about an opportunity to come together and actually just like hear Jesus and celebrate him and worship him. And so, man, our, our worship team uh, is amazing. But man, I'm excited to be here uh, with you all today. If you guys don't know me, uh, my name is Dustin and I'm the, the lead pastor here. And it's just a beautiful Sunday. It's a beautiful Sunday to get together. And if you've been with us, you know we've been going through this series called I Am. We've been going through the series where we've been talking about the I Am statements that Jesus makes in the book of John. And it's been amazing so far. It's been beautiful. I'm learning a lot and I hope that you guys are learning a lot too. And you know, we've gone through a couple of them. You know, I am the bread of life. You know, how Jesus is the sustenance that our soul is desperately looking for. I talked about it a couple weeks ago. Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, right? When, when darkness, uh, when Jesus enters a dark place, darkness trembles. You know, and then last week we talked about when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, right? And how God, Jesus cleans us and he restores us and he takes care of us, he protects us. And it's been amazing, but I don't know, we're going to go through this next moment, but have you ever had a moment where, where the outcome of something was very different than you thought it would be? Or you have a moment where like what you thought was happening around you was very different? I have a story, there's this one time my friends and I, we decided we wanted to go camping in, in my backyard, Right, we wanted to go camping in our backyard, so we set up our huge tent, we brought out all our pillows, we got our blankets, we got the cushions, we got everything we needed. We were so excited, we had our snacks, and you know, we stayed up late, and so it was like, you know, 1 a.m., we fall asleep, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, the weirdest storm I have ever experienced took place. Right, so, so we're sleeping, and all of a sudden, we just hear like, there's just like rain, rain hitting our tent, and then it was like stop, and then it was raining, and it was like windy, and there's like this crazy storm, and everything got wet. I don't know if y'all have ever slept in a tent, but it seems like every time you sleep in a tent, it rains. Right, so if ever you're praying for rain, go sleep in a tent, and it will rain, probably, right? But it rains every single time, right? So we're in the tent, and it's like raining, and it's like this crazy storm I've never experienced before, and everything got wet. Our pillows are wet, our blankets, our cushions, everything was wet. We were comfortable, and then we were not comfortable. And, you know, we were teenagers, right? So we were like, ah, right, this storm will pass, so we're fine. It didn't pass, it just kept going and going, like, whatever. Like, we are soaked, we're cold, it's time to go inside. And the nice thing is that our bed, my bed was like 10 steps away. It wasn't like I was in the middle of the mountains where you have nothing, it's like, this is our life now. Like, we're just cold and wet. Um, and so we go inside, and we wake up in the morning, and I'm like, Mom, like, did you hear that storm last night? It was crazy. She's like, no, there, I, I don't think there was a storm. We're like, okay, there was a storm, like 100%. It was super windy. The wind was changing directions. We were like, this is unbelievable. And then we go out, and we realize that the irrigation system had turned on at like 3 in the morning. And so what we were experiencing was water hitting the tent and then stopping. And we're like, this is a weird storm, right? Like, I've never experienced a storm like this. And then like a couple seconds later, go again across the tent. We're like, man, this storm is crazy. Find out the sprinklers turn on in the middle of the night. So we were camping in the middle of a rainstorm. That's not rain. It's actually our sprinkler system. So we're soaking wet. We don't know what's going on. Find out it was the sprinkler system that caused us to not have a good night's sleep. So we go inside, sleep in there. But man, there's this, there's a, the next statement that Jesus says is, is, is something that we, don't, we wouldn't expect. It's something that isn't, isn't possible, right? It, it's something that is so unique. And the, the thing that we thought was a reality was different than what we perceived it. Sometimes our reality is actually different than what we perceive. And so this, this statement comes uh, from John chapter 11, verse 25. So this is what it says. We can read. It says this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Right? Dead things don't come back to life ordinarily. Dead things do not come back to life ordinarily. Resurrection is defined as something dead that comes back to life. It, it, it's, it's defined as life being breathed back into something that was once dead. That's what resurrection is. Now, I, I have never been in the room with somebody who was dead and then was then alive. I've never, I've been in the room with somebody who has died and I've been in the room with somebody who's been alive. But I've never been in the room with somebody who took, made transition from death to life. I've never been in the room with somebody who's done that, right? I, I've never done that. Maybe you've been in a moment where you've experienced that, but I never have. You know, dead things don't just come back to life. Resurrection is always a miracle. When something dead gets revived, that is always a miracle. The context of this statement, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life, the context of this statement is so beautiful 
and so amazing. It's, a, it's, it's an absolutely incredible, and it comes from the story of Lazarus. Now, if you don't know who Lazarus was, we're going to spend a little bit of time together going through this story, but Lazarus was a guy who had died and then came back to life, and we're going to go through this story together. So we can read here, John 11, verse 1 says this. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So we see Lazarus, right? He's sick. And his sisters, they're they're concerned. So they say, Jesus, like, you need to come. Like your friend, like this guy that you know, this guy that you love, he's sick. And you need to come and you need to be a part of this. He's, He's fallen ill. And I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you've got news like that, where you find out that your spouse is sick, or you find out that your children are really sick, or you find out that your mom or your dad or whatever it is have gotten really sick, or you find out that you're losing your job, or you find out that your car is damaged and you don't know what to do, you find out that, that, that your house is falling apart. This, this news that's devastating. I don't know if you've ever gotten news like that. This news that, that Jesus, your friend, is ill. And these are, these are difficult moments to find ourselves. When we find out that something that we desperately love is sick. Something that we desperately want is falling away. Something that, that we've been hoping for seems to be getting lost. It's difficult for us to find our places in that moment. Now I remember when I was a kid, whenever I would hear bad news, I didn't respond the typical way with like mourning. I, I, was, I was so awkward that I would just start laughing. Like, I'm serious. Like, like, my mom one time told me this bad news. I burst out laughing. And it wasn't because I was, like, like not feeling the news. I was like, I don't know how to respond to this news. So I literally just would burst out laughing. So I'm growing in this, right? Meaning better. But so many times I would respond. People were like, hey, this is happening in my life. And I was like, you know, a teenager, I just smile. And they're like, that's not funny, bro. I'm like, I know it's not funny, but I'm really trying to respond well. But sometimes when we get bad news, how do we respond to this bad news? How do we respond when, when something we feel is getting taken away from us? How do you respond to it? Because this is where Jesus finds himself, in a moment where one of his great friends is sick. Not only is he sick, he's going to die. He's not doing well. And we can see how he responds in John 11 verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You know, sometimes the hardest things that we walk through are for God's glory. Sometimes the most difficult circumstance, sometimes the thing that we wish wasn't going on, sometimes the sickness, sometimes the disease, sometimes the loss is for God's glory. And I think it's so hard for us to actually understand this concept. Because oftentimes when, when, when grief comes, when hard moments come, I'm not usually praising God. Not, like, I'm not going to lie to you. It's very hard when, things are, when things are going hard for us to say, God, this is for your glory. You know, we, we read it. We, we know it. But it's so hard to actually live that out. You know, Jesus says, hey, Lazarus being sick is for God's glory. You know, sometimes when all hell is breaking loose around us and we, can't, we, 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 we feel like everything's falling apart, I want to encourage you, we can't take our eyes off of Jesus. We can't, we can't just turn away because when we turn away, that's when we lose hope. That's when we lose our courage. That's when we lose our joy, our peace, is when we turn our eyes away from the one who's the provider. It's for God's glory that this is happening. You know, when I was a, when I was a kid, my, my grandma got really sick. Now, she was like in her mid-60s, and she ended up passing away of breast cancer when I was, you know, small. She was, you know, 60, 65, I believe. And I remember as a kid, I didn't understand why. Like, like I didn't understand, what, like, why is there death in this world, right? Like, why are, do people have to die? Why, why do bad things happen? Like, why are these things happening? And I think these are questions that, like, we continue to ask ourselves. Because, to, to be honest, I don't know if we fully understand it. Like, why do these things happen? Why do my kids get sick? The other day, my Jane, she had an infection, and I'm literally holding her. She has a fever, and I'm just bawling my eyes out. So I'm like, I wish I, wish I could do something. I wish I, could, I wish I could make you feel better, but I can't. And we don't get it. We don't understand why there's so much pain in the world. We don't get it. 
So my, my grandma, she passes away, and, and I, I didn't understand why. But so much good came from this moment. You know, broken relationships were restored. Habits in people's lives that were broken, addiction was broken, and God was revealed through it. And even at her, at her funeral, God was glorified. You know, and even at the time, again, I didn't get it. I, I was like, why is this happening? And then I just saw God moving. Sometimes the hardest moment for us is for God's glory. Sometimes the most difficult circumstance, the most difficult thing that we walk through, we just need to sit there and say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand this, but I trust you. I, I give you glory in this moment. That's what Jesus is saying this was about. And we can, from here on, we can see what Jesus does and how he responds more to this news. And so John 11, verse 5 to 16, so I'm going to read this. It says this, now Jesus loved Martha, Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now that's a weird thing, right? Like if somebody comes to me and says, hey, like if someone came to me and said, hey, your mom is sick, I'm not going to be like, oh, I love her so much, I'm going to wait two days. Right? Like I'm not going to do that. I'm, gonna be, I'm on like the first, like I'm speeding down to see her. But Jesus, it says he loved her so much, so he stayed two days. We don't get that. Like, why, why didn't he go immediately? So, and then, and then it uh, goes here, verse 7. Uh, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to J Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the news we're just now seeking, they're trying to kill you there. They're trying to stone you there. Why are you going there again? And like, are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he, is, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'll go awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking a rest and sleep, right? The disciples just went right over their head. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. For your, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there that you may believe but let us go to him yeah have you ever had a moment like that though where something goes right over your head somebody has a saying like 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 beth beth and i talk she has all these sayings and i'm like there's like honestly every day i have to be like beth i do not understand what you're saying like i know i know the language that we're speaking english but this this group of words together makes absolutely no sense so every day she has to explain okay this is what this means this is what it means, right? Like, as it goes right over my head. And this is what happened to the disciples. Jesus is like, hey, Lazarus has fallen asleep. Like, whoo! He's going to recover, bro. Like, he's sleeping? That's great news, man. He's going to recover. He's going to get better. And they're like, this is amazing. Praise Jesus. And he's like, okay, poor fellas. Let me say this plainly. Uh, Lazarus is dead. He's died. And then they're like, Oh, <laughs> but so it goes right over their head what Jesus is trying to tell them. And this is exactly what happened to them. And I think the question we need to ask ourselves right now is what is dead in me? What am I dead in? What, is, what, am, what am I actually dead in? Are we dead in sin or are we dead in fear? Are we dead in addiction? Are we dead in our pride? Are we dead in anger? Are we dead in unforgiveness? What am I dead in? What am I dead in? And there's three characters in this story and we're going to look at what they were dead in what they were dead in and there's three different things that i believe that they were dead in and and one of those characters is this guy named thomas now if you know thomas we all know what thomas is known for no thomas is known for doubting like if you remember when Jesus has been resurrected, he's come back to life, he goes and he goes to, uh, and the disciples are like, yo, Jesus is back. He's like, I don't believe it. Unless I can feel the, 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 the holes in his, in his hands and I can see him, I won't believe. That's what Thomas is known for. I think for a lot of us, this is what we would be known for too if uh, people were writing our story, right? We'd be known for doubt. So the first thing that I think that we're dead in is we're dead in our doubt. You know, we can read this, verse 16. This is, honestly, this is one of the funniest moments in the entire Bible. So, they, so Jesus, remember, Jesus just said to them, they just, Jesus said, we're going to Judea. And they're like, don't go to Judea. They're trying to kill you. This is Thomas. 
So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Right? Like he, he's literally like, they're going to kill you. I'm your friend. You're asking me to go with you. Fine. I'm ready to die. So that he's like, let's go. We're going to die. This is a sarcastic statement that he makes, right? Let's just go die with Jesus. I'm ready to do it. So Thomas responds, let us go along with we may die. He, he's doubting. He's doubting what Jesus said he will do. He's, he doesn't have the faith to say, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust Jesus. This is for God's glory. He, he doesn't have that. He's saying, I'm just going to go to Judea and die. This is my future. This is what I'm excited about. I think a lot of us, we can relate to Thomas a bit. Because if you've ever had spiritual doubts, have you ever had a moment where you doubted God? Have you ever had a moment where you doubted God was real? Have you ever had a moment where you, you doubted? I think all of us have a moment where we can look back to and say, I doubted. And I, I have that, I have moments like that to this day where I just sit there and I'm like, I, I don't know if he can make, get me through this moment. I don't, I don't know if I have enough faith. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I think a lot of us, we have doubt. Just like Thomas had, you know, I've had prayers where I, I prayed prayers without faith. Or I prayed things and like, this isn't going to happen. I just prayed it because I know I'm supposed to. And I didn't have the faith that something would actually happen. I've doubted God when it comes to my finances. I've doubted God when it comes to my health. I've doubted God when it comes to the health of others. I've doubted God. I think a lot of us, we, we feel guilty about that. We feel guilty like, like I shouldn't doubt. But I think there's still moments where we do. Because it's, it's not easy. When difficult moments come up, doubt shows up. And we need to step out of doubt and step into courage. And faith and say, God, I don't get this but I trust you. We've all doubted at some point. Some of us doubt almost every single day. We doubt everything. We have little faith when it comes to day-to-day -day life and we're dead in our doubt. Number, number two, the second character um, is Mary. And it's this, is that we're dead in our hopelessness. And Mary, another character in the story, verse, uh, John 11, verse 17. Now when Jesus came, we found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But this but Mary remained seated in the house. See, Martha, she left to go see Jesus, right? She's like, there's got to be something. There's got to be something to hope for. Mary, she stayed seated in the house. She stayed home. She had no hope. Like, like, Jesus isn't here. He's been dead four days. That's it. I have nothing to hope for anymore. Some of us, our dream or our, our faith has been dead for so long. That's where we're at. We just, we don't hope anymore. We just sit at home. We sit in our depression. We sit in our anxiety. We sit in our fear. And we have no hope that we're ever going to make it out. Some of us, that's where we're at. We're stuck in hopelessness. We look at our life and we say, I'm always going to be depressed. I'm always going to be going job to job to job. I'm always going to not have a job. I'm always never going to get married. I'm never going to find the right person. I'm never going to be able to have kids. I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to have the job that I wish I had. I'm never going to see these dreams inside of me become a reality. I'm always going to be like this. I'm always going to be like this. We're like Mary. We have no hope on the other side. We, we, when, when we see something awesome happening, an opportunity to serve or an opportunity to give or something, we just stay back. He's like, I have nothing to hope for anymore. And this is Mary. Martha went to see Jesus. Mary's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm staying home. I don't, I don't need to be a part of this anymore. I'm broken. Jesus doesn't care. I'm done. And I find myself in this place. Oftentimes, I don't know if you do, where I look at my circumstance, and I think, I'm never going to make it out. Like, like, we feel like we're just stuck in a tunnel and we can't see light on either side. And we're like, this is where I die. We have nothing to hope for. Nothing to dream about. Nothing to be excited about. This is where we find ourselves because hopelessness creeps in. You know, dead in our doubt that in our hopelessness, number two is this, is that we're dead in our timing. You know, we can read Martha. 
Martha, uh, uh, verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my mother, my, my brother would not have died. You know, because she said, hey, we told you and you waited two days. If only you would have come when I asked you to come, then he would still be alive. Why did you do this? How many times do we wish God would show up when we wanted him to be there? We, we want him to show up before the terrible circumstance. He says, I'm going to show up in the middle of it and carry you through. You know, he's there the whole time. But if you see this moment, she's like, God, where were you? How many times do we have that prayer? God, where were you? Where were you when I, when I was abused as a child? Where were you? You took too long. Do you see my brokenness now? Do you see my pain? If only you had been here. If only you answered my prayer earlier. If only you provided earlier. If only you were here before I got into all this debt. If only you were here. If only. We oftentimes have high expectations on when God is going to do something. When? I think oftentimes we have higher expectations on the when than the, than the what. We care more about when he does something than even sometimes what he does. Do you want to find out the answer to a question right away, right? This is, our, this is our culture. We want everything instantaneously, right? Like if I go to Tim Hortons and my coffee takes more than 2.5 2 minutes, I'm done. I'm frustrated. The worst... I, you know when you go somewhere and they're like, hey, your food's not ready, but like, can you go park in the stall? We'll bring it right out to you. I'm telling you, that is the most frustrating thing. And then there's this other moment, right, where that happens, and then you see the person bring out the bag. You're like, oh, yeah, bring it to a different car. I'm, t I'm telling you, that is so frustrating. But we want everything instantaneous, right? Beth and I, we have a Google Home. I'm so lazy now. I do not know the last time I, I picked up my phone and was asked and went on, what's the weather like? I'm always like, hey, Google, what's the weather like today? And then she tells me. Like, I've become so lazy. I want everything right away. I don't want to wait for anything. I don't want to wait for, for anything. And we think that it's the same with God. We say, God, show me who my future wife is. Show her to me. I want to see her. And we hear nothing. We say, God. Give me the job right now. He's like, no, I'm preparing you for the job first. I'm preparing you for your future spouse. I'm preparing you to be a parent. I'm preparing you. We, we, sometimes we want God to be instantaneous, and soft, sometimes he waits. He waited two days. If only he had been there earlier, Mar Mar uh, Martha says. If only you came earlier. We expect him to show up right away and provide everything we need right in a moment. But that doesn't build our faith. What builds our faith is being patient. And I'm telling you, in our society, patience is a lost virtue. We don't, we're not patient anymore. We, 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 we don't like waiting. We don't like when our kids don't obey us right away. We don't like it when, when, when we're waiting for other people to provide work because we need to do the work and we're waiting for their project to get to us so we can do it. We don't like being patient. We don't like waiting. And this is what we need to go back to is being patient and saying, God, I don't get this timing. Like, I do not get why you couldn't have prevented this from happening. But now that it's happened, God, I need you in this moment. I need you right now because we're dead in our doubt. We're dead in our hopelessness and we're dead in our timing and we lose faith based on these things. But right after Martha, right after, right after she says, if only you were here, right after she shares her anger with Jesus about when he came, she says something so powerful in verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Even now. Even now. You know, she had this moment where she realized there's nothing I can do. It's already happened. My brother's dead. He's been dead for four days. 
There's nothing that I can do. And she says this, even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. This is a great statement. Even now Lazarus is dead, something can still happen. Even now that I've piled up all this debt, something can still happen. Even now, God can still show up. Even now. In the next verse, verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. You know, it would have been easier, right, for Jesus to say that right away. Right? Like, hey, your brother's going to rise again. No, he, he waited. You know, what, what we feel, we can show that. Like, it's, it's okay for us to be like, God, I'm frustrated. That's what Martha, right? I'm frustrated. Mary, I'm frustrated. Thomas, I'm going to go die. Right? It's okay. But what's not okay is living there. We're not, it's not, we can't just live there. Jesus says, hey, I'm going to pull you out of this. I'm going to pull you from death to life. I'm going to take you from where you were to where you're supposed to be. I'm going to be taking you from outside your calling into your calling. That's what I'm going to do. Verse 25 says this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know your circumstance. I don't know. But what I do know and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection? Or do you believe that it was just a moment in history? This is before Jesus was resurrected. You have to understand that the resurrection is not just a moment in history. The resurrection is a human being, Jesus. He came as a human. He's God. He's human. And he says, I am the resurrection. I am. Jesus says, I am. I'm the one. I am God and I am the resurrection in life. I will give you life. I will take the most dead part of who you are and I will bring restoration. I will bring life. I will bring joy. I will bring peace. That's who I am. I bring you life. In the most dead parts of your soul, the most dead parts of your body, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you life. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? When we come into a relationship with Jesus, dry bones are awakened. The dreams we had are brought back to life. The desires we have are brought back to life. Dead things come to life. When we're dead in our doubt, he brings us faith. When we're dead in our hopelessness, he brings us hopefulness. And when we're dead in our timing, he shows us the better timing. When Jesus walks into a room, dead things come to life. We all have and have had things in our lives that are dead. Romans 6, that's what it says. Romans 6, verse 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. How can we have died to sin and still live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, were, in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, right here, we might walk in the newness of life. We are dead to sin and alive in Jesus when we enter in relationship with him. Once we have a moment where we give Jesus our life, we're dead to sin and he said, hey, you can walk in the newness of life. The freedom of life that I have for you. He brings you new dreams. He brings you new hopes. He brings you new faith. Some of us, we spend too much time in the tomb because death has become comfortable. We are so comfortable. We've been dead for so long. We are so comfortable. And this is, we go to this, verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stove lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And then Martha comes up. She says, the sister of the dead man, she said to him, Lord, by this time, there will be an odor. He's been in there four days. He's going to be stinky. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, to, said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips and his face was wrapped in a cloth and Jesus said to them, unbind them and let him go. Right now, I believe this wholeheartedly, that Jesus is calling you by name, saying, time to come out of the grave. I want you to picture this. You're coming out. You're bound up. You're chained up. And Jesus is saying, let's unbind you together. And that's the beauty of church, right? We come together. And Jesus says, you unbind them. Jesus allows us to be a part of the life. He says, hey, unbind him. That's it. I believe right now God is bringing, Jesus is bringing freedom to your soul. I believe that right now Jesus is bringing life to the most dead part of you. The part of you that you wish was still there. The part of you, the dream you had when you were a kid that you let die. Jesus is saying, I'm calling you by name. It's time to be unbound. It's time for the chains to be broken. It's time for addiction to fall off. It's time for you to start living in what I've called you to live. Bringing you from death to life. He's calling you by name. Calling the dreams inside of you to life calling you out of the grave and into relationship with him calling you out of brokenness calling you out of sin he's calling you by name saying it's going to be okay it's time for you to step into your future death can no longer control you some of us were so afraid to come out of the tomb because of the smell we've been dead for so long we we don't know if people are going to recognize us we don't know if, if people are going to be okay with the transformation. We don't know if, if our friends are going to want to be friends with us anymore. Our family is going to want a relationship with us anymore. So we're afraid to come out of the tomb. I believe the door is open and he's waiting for you to step out. Step out of the tomb. He's done. I've done my job. Time for you to do your job. Step out of the grave. Let him clean you and bring you the newness you desperately need. And one thing we've been doing as part of this the series together I am is we've been having takeaway statements and this is our takeaway today it says the resurrection is not just a moment in history the resurrection is a person and that person is Jesus yeah. it's not just a moment it's a story it's a journey the resurrection is not just a moment it's a person and that person is Jesus you know we have a, a song that we're going to sing our team's going to lead us in and I just want to encourage everyone just to stand right now in this moment